Hey guys, welcome back to VGC and another episode of Off The Record. We're going to talk about all the big news from the games industry this week and I've got two of the industry's busiest experts on the show today. We've got our very own Andy Robertson. Andy, how are you doing, mate? You alright? Very good, mate. How are good. you? I'm good, actually. I'm good. It's Friday, so I'm excited. It's always good when it's Friday. Um, tired, though. I spent too long last night trying to learn how to do, be a Twitch streamer and it didn't work very well. But it was good <laughs> fun anyway. And we've also got a very well-lit Chris Dring from GamesIndustry.biz. Got a, uh, looking, looking nice and vibrant there, Chris. You all right? Yeah, I'm... <laughs> You've made fun it's of just standing, standing next to the sun. <laughs> I've, um, I've, uh, I've got new... Uh, equipment because we did a conference yesterday and i'm trying to get it trying to do it properly it looks uh, lovely yeah, I'm, not, I'm not very sure how <laughs> no no it looks good don't worry about it and uh, we've got loads a nice of tan by the end of this <laughs> I mean, who needs a time going outside at the moment? You can just sit indoors as well at the same time. Um, we've got loads to talk about today, as you can see across the bottom. We're going to dive uh, into a little bit of Warzone chat, maybe some uh, GoldenEye and Bond chat in general. And also, we're going to start uh, with Halo Infinite. Where else can we start from? That is um, the big news currently in the games industry. Uh, Halo Infinite has been delayed. There's been loads of talk about from Phil Spencer about maybe they're going to even consider splitting Halo into sections and how apparently Game Pass is going to pick up the book, basically, from Halo not being there, and, and also how 343 have said that they're in agreement about the graphics uh, need a little bit of upgrading. Um, Andy, what's your take on this Halo Infinite delay? Um, my, my feeling is that, and I'd love to know what Chris thinks, I think it has to be based on the reaction from the showcase uh, this close to release. Uh, yeah. I think they would have known well in advance of now whether it was feasible uh, to release it, uh, you know, what kind of quality state it was going to be in. I mean, certain things, I mean, from my experience, right, of working on, on games, certain things internally, you become desensitized to it, like, because the whole, the team, the development team are staring at this game, slowly iterating over years and years and years. You don't see the wood for the trees, basically. Yeah. So, it's very feasible that that reaction, it going out and, and the, you know, the entire fan base being like, this game doesn't look very good graphically, could well have caught them by surprise because that, that sort of thing does happen. Um, you know, like when, when we were working on Ukulele 1, I remember we released it and absolutely everyone said the camera was rubbish. And not one of us thought the camera was rubbish because I guess we were just, you know, it's something that we had got used to over many years. Um, but it looks like blatantly obvious feedback. And that's why it's good to put your games out early these days, development develop them inside the uh, community and stuff like that, because these sorts of issues get flagged early. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't see that this is just something that's just cropped up, that they've just worked out that, um, you know, they're not going to hit their dates, their quality levels, etc. cetera. I, I personally am feeling very cynical uh, about that. I think it's the right decision. I think they're yeah. better off you know, putting out a great game in six months' time than a disappointing one, especially the fact that Halo 4 and 5, mm. the most recent ones, didn't exactly set the world on fire. Um, and, you know, the, these new consoles, do they really need these big brands up front? They, they get bought by early adopters. Uh, people who are going to buy these consoles have already decided they're going to buy them, in my opinion. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Chris. I, I think it's a huge blow to Xbox Series X. Um... Uh, you're right. They, will be, they are bought by early adopters. Early adopters tend to be a little bit less uh, Xbox fans. I, I think about my sort of. I'm a Nintendo fan, and I didn't get a Wii U at launch because there wasn't a reason for me to get a Wii U. I knew I was going to get one. There was no incentive for me to get one at launch because the there were new Super Mario Brothers game, Nintendo Land. I wasn't interested. I was waiting for the game. There's no reason for me to spend money at launch on that. And then eventually, I got it uh, as I would do. I think, I think you do need a reason to buy a machine, um, and particularly at this Christmas. And if, and if you're going up against, and if you're one of those people who, like me, that actually likes all games consoles, I'm actually thinking, oh, I won't need an Xbox this Christmas, because I've got, I'll get a PlayStation, because that's going to have Spider-Man on it, and I get to play that, and I'll get the Xbox when Halo comes out. And I think if you lose that momentum, if you don't get that momentum up and running, um, I, it can be really, really tough. Um, now, obviously, you're right. It might be that um, um, that you know they're they're, they're going to sell out very quickly, and everyone will rush out to buy to play Assassin's Creed or whatever. And that um, and then Halo coming like four months later or three months later 
is a chance for them to maintain that momentum. There is that possibility, but I, I can't, not having a major game of your own. At, at I, I still think their biggest um, appeal is perhaps still not announced because I mean, and I'm wandering into massive speculation territory here. You imagine that those two machines come out, I mean, obviously there's big, big third party games out this year. Um, mm -hmm. As you mentioned, Assassin's Creed, there'll be a new Call of Duty. Um, Cyberpunk's going to be there through Back Compat. You imagine they're going to have presumably the cheapest console with uh, Series S. Uh, you would, you would presume. Uh, we don't know if they they um, pull some kind of big game pass. I mean, Game Pass is obviously the thing, right? I mean, we've been talking about this for yonks. If they pull out some big Game Pass deals, which have kind of been hinted at by Phil Spencer this week. I mean, look, the complete speculation. Imagine if, say, for example, Assassin's Creed is on Game Pass uh, with that console as a deal. I mean, I don't, I don't do platform gear deals. I don't know what I'm talking about in this regard. <laughs> but you would, you would have to imagine the cost to Microsoft to put that on Game Pass is surely less than buying an exclusive outright. Say, for example, a Tomb Raider that they did for Xbox, because you're not, you don't have to replace the lost sales on other platforms because it will still be there. Yeah, um, I tweeted that actually about an hour ago. Um, <laughs> <Did you? laughs> no way! I honestly have not read that. <laughs> so now with his tweets, Andy, what's going um, on here? <laughs> right. So the Xbox is prime. If you think about it from a um, what Xbox is trying to do is sell Game Pass, but Game Pass is part of this series. You know, the, the package before, if we just, if we think about the, pr the consumer pr proposition, for PlayStation is here's, look, look at our lovely super fast machine, look at Spider-Man, come buy it. And Xbox is, is, hey, come and look at our high-end machine, look at Halo, you will give three months, two months, one month, whatever, Game Pass with the machine, which also gets you access to Sea of Thieves and Forza Horizon 4 looking a lot nicer. That's an interesting proposition. It's quite a competitive one. Take away Halo Infinite and what you've got is Game Pass with a load of um, games that came out a couple of years ago looking a bit nicer. It's not quite the same appeal. But if they were to sign Cyberpunk as a, a Game Pass, in Game Pass for six months, 12 months, whatever, if they were to sign um, uh, uh, Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs, something like that, in, and put that into Game Pass, that could be their Halo replacement. Because that's the point, right? It's about getting mm. Game Pass subscriptions. And then you've got got my console, got my Game Pass subscription for a month, got that big game. The big game doesn't have to be Halo. And then Halo can come out later and it'll be another boost for Game Pass. I think that's the real aim is to get those Game Pass subscri subscribers up. But it is linked to the next generation Game Passes. They aren't separate because there will come a point when those games in Game Pass will only be playable on Xbox Series X. And that might be in two years time or 18 months time. Xbox will need to have a big install base on Series X by that point. So they want to get the momentum going. They want to drive. They want to encourage people to upgrade. I'm not forcing people to do it, but they want to encourage people. And um, and yeah, if they can sign a big game, or um, and and then and then you you push their back catalogue looking nicer, then it might alleviate some of the stress. But I think in terms of people who are just looking at what console to get this Christmas, I think it has. It will, I mean, I think people are already pushed towards PlayStation anyway. But I think it will. I mean, I feel personally. But, but again, it's like all that. Sorry, gone, Steve. No, I was going to say. Um, I, as someone who is a PlayStation person, I have actually been tempted towards being, I want to find a reason to buy an Xbox, and I'm sure there will be at some point. But I was kind of thinking, Joe, I've not played like a Halo game in like 10 years, so maybe this will be the one to get back it. And I don't know, it felt a little bit like a, not a kick in the teeth, so that's a bit harsh to say, but definitely a little bit like, oh, well, I was thinking about maybe using that as my kind of first console around Christmas. And it does feel like a little bit of a delay, but you, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a little bit... I guess if you're looking for a reason to jump ship, it feels like, and I, I don't, maybe they're not expecting people to jump ship. Maybe that is a point that um, I'm making that's not even relevant because are they really trying to win over new people or are they just trying to push towards Game Pass? But I don't know. But you, you've got that appeal, right? So if you're a PlayStation fan that spent all generation playing on PlayStation, love the PlayStation, it's really good. But you know what? It means you missed out on Forza Horizon 4, Sea of Thieves, Gears 5, and you're sitting there thinking, oh, they look really nice on that new Series X. Oh, there's a brand new Halo. You know what? Maybe, maybe I'll you know give Series X a go and give Xbox a go this time. Yeah, it might get subscribed. It's not going to cost me loads of money. And we, we still, we again, I still don't think we know the most important information. I mean, obviously, Xbox lost a lot of ground at the start of the last gen with the fact that it was significantly more expensive. 
um, you know, we, we knew that games did not run as well. Um, and obviously there were other elements. Those, those elements could absolutely feasibly apply to PlayStation 5. Um, yeah. Even though it's, you know, what we're, we're kind of reading and, and hearing from developers is that even though in kind of raw um, specifications, it's um, not as powerful as a Series X, it's obviously got a lot of um, kind of custom architecture within it. Um, obviously the SSD, uh, you know, a lot of its um, kind of uh, clocking architecture is uh, quite unique. So it could conceivably, the PlayStation 5, be a more expensive machine uh, with third-party games that don't run as well uh, on, as on the Xbox, because the Xbox is presumably going to be a more simple console to, to um, port to at launch, as we've seen time and time again with these consoles that have got the, these, these custom elements. So I think it's, it's easy now to paint a um, kind of dark picture for Xbox. But if PlayStation 5 come out next, you know, next um, next month and say that they're 500 quid and the Series S is closer to 350, 300, and it's got Game Pass on it, you know, I mean, even we're talking about, we're speculating about third party exclusives on Game Pass. All the first party stuff's going to be on there. We know that. So every first party game that they have uh, at launch is going to effectively cost you bugger all if you buy that Xbox. I think it's a huge, huge proposition. It's a great value proposition. I think it's quite a hard thing to explain and sell. Um, and you've got two machines. One is woefully, you know, what's it? The, rep the, re the report is it's, it's a third of the power of yeah, X. It's the Series, Series but, S. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's uh, well, I mean, again, we don't know. Um, but from what I gather, it's the same CPU, the same SSD, and it's the GPU that is um, significantly less powerful. And I think we've discussed this before on, uh, on, on this uh, show, that if that's the case, then it's not as big a drop as you want, because you know, as you've mentioned before, Chris, developers uh, keep you know, saying to me in regards to this, that the biggest jump is the CPU. Um, mm. If you think about it in terms of PC gaming, and obviously Xbox is very much a PC these days, um, that just means that the geometry looks slightly less pretty the games will be the same. I don't think it will be the same uh, situation as you kind of saw with cross-gen, last-gen, where the environments are kind of limited, the number of enemies, stuff like that. I think if it can keep the same CPU, then actually it's, um, it's still going to be a big leap over yeah. what we're used to. Yeah, I, I, just, I just think it's... I always think, I always thought from the start, Xbox have a harder sell because they're not... They're simply by the nature of their strategy. Like, they're not about... You don't have to buy the console. Right. But I know a lot of people, a lot of people went on about the fact that Halo Infinite wasn't an exclusive and all this kind of stuff. It was on Xbox One. And I sort of shrugged my shoulders on that because the Breath of the Wild wasn't a Switch exclusive, yet it still sold millions of Switches. So I wasn't, I wasn't really that, that bothered by that. But when I look at, um, so I, I would say losing Halo from that launch lineup, I think is a, is a, but I think it's a blow to Game Pass. To be honest, that's the thing. Like I think it's not even well, about the console. I just want to. Read that quote. Uh, basically, um, Andy hinted it before, but basically, Phil Spencer has been pretty, um, pretty confident. I mean, I know it's his job to be pretty confident, but the quote he came out about Game Pass and the potential strong announcements goes as follows: He said, "Our investment in Game Pass, that portfolio continues to be strong. We've got some more really great strong announcements to come about things coming to Game Pass. So they obviously really are pushing Game Pass in that maybe Halo Infinite void coming up. Um, I mean, that's a pretty definitive statement. Really great strong announcements to come about uh, things coming to Game Pass. Surely that does, as you were saying earlier, hint at something that's going to be, it's going to turn heads. It has to turn heads. Surely, I, I personally personally would not be surprised if they snapped something up for Game Pass on Series X at this point. I mean, you'd have to imagine... Do they have to now, maybe? I, I don't think they have to at all, no, but personally. But if their backs are to the wall, uh, the only thing they can realistically do in this time frame, in this environment of the pandemic, is to go and chuck some money at something for Game Pass. The Game Pass... Well, I mean, Microsoft want to be selling lots of Game Passes this Christmas. They want something to put a hook on that. They want yeah. to go, right, go and this is the time for you to subscribe to Game Pass. Let's get that 10 million, 12 million, 15 million to 20 million. And Halo would have been a really big selling point this Christmas, particularly if the pandemic's still going on. Get to get into Game Pass. Only costs you 10 quid. Probably, there's probably a $1 for a month. 
you get to play Halo, a brand new Halo. That was going to clearly going yeah. to be a big selling point, not just for the console, but most specifically for Game Pass. Um, if you don't have that, what is Xbox's big Game Pass title for Christmas? And this is weird, like we're talking about it like a console. What is the big Game Pass game for Christmas? But you're right, though. Games still sell Game Pass, don't they? So that's the thing. Game Pass yeah. may sell the Xbox, but you need games to sell the Game Pass. So. so I think that's the question. I'm sure Xbox have an answer, and they will tell us when they're ready. Um, moving away from Xbox, uh, we're going to talk about GoldenEye, uh, because as you may have seen on VGC, uh, the GoldenEye fan game, the very beautiful GoldenEye fan game, the remake, uh, unfortunately, the inevitables uh, happened. GoldenEye 25, which was meant to be uh, a tribute to the classic N64 shooter, has unfortunately been shut down after, I think, four years, three years of development, which must be a kick in the teeth for the developers. Um, it's disappointing, um, and also, where, where is the Bond? Where are the Bond games in general? This is one of the most iconic IPs in world entertainment, um, and we, we seem to have a shortage uh, of actually good Bond games. I mean, is there any at all other than like Golden Idols? There was the World is Not Enough as well, wasn't there? But um, what's your take on this story, then, Andy? Um, so I imagine Chris can add more on this one as a, a, a part of the Bond super fans at GI. Oh. oh, I didn't um, realize, but. I mean, it's it's obviously it's a big shame, you know, to be working on it for three years. It looked really good. It had the support of the a lot of the original developers. Um, you know, they they must have known that this was a possibility and a likely outcome. I'd say the most disappointing thing from my perspective is is as you said that there aren't have, there aren't any Bond games coming out. You know, they're kind of servicing a an audience that. That's that's not being served ultimately by the, the license holder. Um, I would have hoped that in, in these modern times, when you see a lot of these, um, you've seen a lot of success with um, uh, fans kind of being brought on board by the, the kind of the official right holders. I mean, you know, I think of like Sonic Mania and stuff like that, which was a big success, and it was a, it was a mod community. Um, you know, the amount of games in history that have been gone on to be huge that have come out of the mod community yeah. is is significant. So I would have hoped that perhaps they, you know, could have signed it up. But I think that might have been a pipe dream considering that there's not really games yeah. are not clearly not in their their the, kind of towel lights at the moment. The World of Seven this, Legends is the last one in two thousand and twelve. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't even remember that, but do you, do you remember it, Chris? <laughs> that wasn't great. I remember, I remember them. Everything or nothing was all right. There were a few okay Bond games. There were, there were, there were two answers. The, the questions are actually, there's two things happening here. GoldenEye, not cut to the that come out, was inevitable. Because let's not forget yeah. that Rare had made a GoldenEye remake or working well on a GoldenEye remake that never came out because they couldn't get the rights. <laughs> right? So, um, <laughs> so if... if, 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 if Microsoft and Rare couldn't get the rights. <laughs> and they, they were basically forbidden from making the game. It was inevitable that the fan made up. The only way the Ben fan Colclough, he's got big balls and a fair play to Ben Colclough for giving that a go thing and just challenging MGM there. That's, a, that's impressive. Maybe, maybe. I, think, I, think, I think it's some of it's Eon, I think. But the, 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 the thing is with... Um, the thing is with... Uh, uh, the fan made thing is the only... I actually hoped it would come out because they just didn't notice. And I would love to have got <laughs> love to have been, you said I no. actually I spoke to uh, Grant Kirkhope the other day um, after it happened, the composer of Golden Knight, and that's what that's what he said. He basically said, I bet you they didn't even notice it existed for three years and one of their kids <laughs> has just seen it on YouTube and gone look that. I think it's mental. I think it's such a, I think you think think we're in remake culture, right? Everyone's remaking stuff from the nineties that are yeah, super well. and they've done so well. Like yeah. you talk about, you know, Crash Bandicoots and the Spyros and the Tony Hawks coming up and just so many big classic games from that era coming out, being remade, selling millions, even more than they did back then. And you think, well, what's the most iconic N64 game, right? And it is golden up. Literally a console um, seller, wasn't it, back in the day? I remember my console, N64, came with that in. And I remember it, my dad being so excited that he let me open it early at Christmas <laughs> just to play in it as well. That's how much of a big deal it was. It was incredible. It, was, it honestly turned me from being uh, somebody that played games with my brother every now and again, mostly Donkey Kong Country and Super Mario World, from that being that person to the obsessed gamer that meant I had to do this for a career. Um, Golden Knight. So I'm a, I'm a super fan um, of that game and I really want a remake. 
I hate the fact that they there's now two that pretty much exist or have been worked on and they just can't come out. I bet it hold up well. I bet it hold up. I, d- I don't know. I don't. I'm about to completely contradict what you're saying. Well, you're wrong, um, unfortunately. I'm, <laughs> I'm a huge, huge GoldenEye fan. It's definitely in my top five games of all time. Like it influenced me massively. Um, it's probably the first game that I can remember that I just played for, you know, more than a year non-stop. Yes, I agree. Yeah. You know, all the meeting up, all the kids on my street, and you know, playing multiplayer every single chance I could get. No, but I job. think if you go if you go back to it, and I do go back to it, um, like me and uh, my friends actually, we are once a year, um, kind of get the N64 out and play it. God, it's awful now. Oh, absolutely I, awful. I mean, the it level structure. Fifteen. It runs at 15 frames. Uh, you know, it's a completely unplayable. And I kind of, I kind of think, to be honest, that even if you updated it, all the modern traits, I think you would kind of lose what it was. The type of game that it is, as, uh, as is, is just, it's just changed. The genre has moved on completely. A lot of the, it's like, it's like taking Resident Evil One, right, and putting all modern controls on it. And like, you know, an open world and it's, suddenly it's not Resident Evil anymore. I think you'd have to, you know, those N64 controls that are restrictive, like the fact that you, there's not twin stick and stuff like that. You put twin stick on GoldenEye, you kind of kill it. You put online on GoldenEye, you kill it. The essence of what that game was is that there's four screens and you're spying on your mate and you know he's hiding in the toilet and you're awkwardly <laughs> strafing sideways in there. I don't think it would, I don't, I'm what not. What about a Final Fantasy VII remake job then? What about a Final Fantasy VII remake job? Just literally, you know, in terms of, so they took the source material and they just expanded it. So you, you think of like, um, I don't know, 7A, you know, when you're out in the cold and the snow and all that kind of stuff. Imagine that wasn't just endless snow, you know, endless white fields. It looked beautiful, potentially. I, I, go on, go on, Chris. It's not that they have remade GoldenEye like that. There's been the GoldenEye, the, the Activision game. They did do that. They, they, re, they reimagined it, basically. But um, I actually disagree with Andy. I think there was a lot of people in their 30s that like to go back to things. I go back to GoldenEye and I'm frustrated by the frame rate and I'm frustrated by the fact the way it controls. And I'm like, ugh, but I love this game. I have so much nostalgia for it. So even though I'm frustrated by it, I still play it with my mates for several hours, more than once a year, if not this year, because I can't get them around the house. But um, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, the idea of being able to do that, I, I the, the, the HD reader of Perfect Dark is probably my most played game of this generation. Yeah, so that's um, brilliant. But the thing is, they, that is essentially, as you just said, they've updated the textures, right? Yeah, they updated the textures, yeah. they updated the controls. It runs, you know, still, it doesn't run perfectly, I've never but played it runs that. I need pretty to. well. Um, the, um, the uh, uh, yeah, I, I, and that's what I, that's what I want. And per- Perfect Dark is better than GoldenEye, by the way. Um, I never got into the multiplayer <laughs> quite as much, time. personally. I struggle Perfect with the multiplayer. Dark is, is, Perfect Dark is, uh, I'd say, one of the best games of its of its era just yes. purely from i would say from the prospect that it, it got given so much development time they could have released that game a year earlier with half the features it's oh, just I, absolutely I, packed with stuff that game the perfect dark is amazing but whenever i go to the multiplayer um the complexity of it um i like the dark sims i love playing with certain elements of it but the yeah. levels the best levels in perfect dark are the golden ones. yeah <laughs> yeah no you're right you're yeah. right it's, it's a bit of a weird one because you can actually you can actually almost see uh the the kind of the through line in that game where the original golden eye team left and they brought in a load of new guys to basically ship it all of the, the earlier stuff in the campaign was all done by, or I understand, by the original team before they left because there was a huge exodus right in the middle of the development of that game, of course, where the original GoldenEye team left to make Free Radical. Um, and you can, you can see it because, like, it's definitely a big, um, it's a very spiky game in terms of design quality. Well, that's what I think is amazing about it. It is one of the best games of all time, and its development team basically left halfway through, and a new one took over, and it somehow still holds together really, really well. I love Perfect Dark. I do think Perfect Dark is great, but I have a Perfect Dark. I don't have Goldeneye. I'd love it, and I think it would do really, really well. But it, you know, it comes. Oh yeah, I think it would do really, really well. I just think all those people would realise it's not that great. (laughs) Not not in twenty, not in twenty twenty, anyway. Remember the last spy game we got? I can't even Hitman. Yeah, it's just Hitman. Hitman. Hitman is modern Goldeneye. I've been saying this for a long time. Yeah, they, yeah. If they if they remake Perfect Dark, 
it should be Hitman. That is the, the natural evolution of the gameplay of those games. They're spy games. You get given a list of objectives, and then you should be able to come at them from uh, multiple directions. So exactly yeah. what Hitman does is a sample. Now you're right. That'd be wonderful, and, wouldn't it? I would, in that kind of that, that whole, uh, especially different ways to do it for, for Joanna to just kind of, you know, essentially, oh, that'd be amazing. That'd be absolutely, I'd, I'd even take episodic as well in the way that, you know, Hitman did. I think that would yeah, work really Hitman's well. Hitman's well. an absolutely awesome game. And to answer your other question, the reason why there aren't any James Bond games is the same reason there aren't. There isn't a Hunger Games game, you know, which you make sense a battle royale of Hunger Games. Why isn't there? There's no need. If you are, if you are, um, if you are um, a game like, starters, games IP are bigger than film IP. Um, so if you're going and if you are and if you're going to make a James Bond game in games, you're going to make one right now. It's not going to get compared to, and you're going to make it in two years. It's not getting compared to Hitman. It's getting compared to Call of Duty. It's getting compared to Fortnite. It's getting compared to the biggest games in the genre. And so therefore you have to spend as much money and as much time and as much effort building it as you would, uh, uh, if you look at Spider-Man and the Arkham games, those games are made like AAA massive yeah, products. Yeah. And, but the thing is, some of the money is going to, to the license holders. So, um, so it, it, there is an element of, if you're going to make that game, you kind of either have to do it indie or you're going to have to do it proper triple A. There's almost no room in the middle. You can't, you know, it, that, the IP is too big. Yeah. And, I, and I just think that it's a very, very big task. I think there is definitely room for James Bond. I, sh- I felt a uh, tinge of warm nostalgia uh, this week when the reviews came in uh, saying how shit the uh, Fast and Furious game is, by the way. <laughs> and a lot of the reaction among people of like our sort of age was like, actually sounds quite good. I might give it a go. Like I'm just saying, like it's so shoddy. And it felt, it felt right. It felt like it, we were home again, you know? <laughs> That's oh, how games, a, a game crap, and film time should be. A licensed game. Yeah. Good. Do you remember the Harry Potter ones? They were something else, weren't they, entirely? Oh, My man. missus convinced themselves it was good when she was younger, but wow, they are bad. They are just <laughs> painfully bad. They are like, you don't really see many games that bad anymore. You know, it's almost like there's a level of... Co- That's another discussion entirely. I, I've got a thing about... Um, game scores and how there should be um i think largely like there's there's not even bad games from triple a developers you can't make bad games fundamentally oh yeah man you're you're opening a whole new conversation yeah but that's kind of where it's about level of because there there aren't um seven out of ten games are i'm I'm sure someone wrote a feature about this um seven out of ten games are interesting like i would rather play a seven out of ten game than uh, like a nine out of ten game because generally these days triple a games for obvious reasons uh, the cost and the risk are quite compartmental, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, they all have the same systems. They all do similar things, have similar structure. Uh, whereas a seven out of ten usually means they tried something different, and some people don't like it, and that's good. A lot of the best, you know, entertainment, the best art, you know, is gonna is gonna be um, have kind of opposing reactions. Is that if everyone you likes by, uh, something? Then have you brought to you by Kojima by any chance? That's what he'd like you to I, do. I, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of, um, of Death Stranding, but I love that it exists. You yeah, know? I totally I love agree, that yeah. he tried something new. And I would rather have a whole bunch of Death Strandings every year than, you know, I'm trying to think of a reaction that's not hugely offensive. Well, like, let's be honest. You know, like, it, I can Ubisoft say it's Ubisoft Open World Game number seven. Or then, um, even as much as I enjoyed them. As much as I enjoyed them. Uncharted, uh, Spider-Man, God of War, The Last of Us. I mean, there's just a scene right through all of them in terms of the mechanics. They're, they're, the, the, they're like the so, same game taken yeah. by different teams. Now, don't right? get me wrong. I've enjoyed them all. But they, 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 you, get, you get familiar, don't you, straight away when you're playing these games. But I'm digressing massively. Let's go into something that's even more mainstream than all those things we talked about. Warzone. Call of Duty Warzone basically has been teasing uh, massively about uh, Black Ops. Uh, VGC, of course, have reported this quite heavily. Um, it looks like uh, they've started this now with a... Uh, uh, know your history. Uh, what's all that about, Andy? Um, I don't. I've not really been following this story. I'll be totally honest. But it's got like know your history teasers in it, or something like that, with Black Ops. So they're they're um, obviously they're announcing. They're going through the motions of announcing the new Call of Duty, which is um, Black Ops uh, Cold War, which is the, the kind of the most open secret of of the year. Um, I get the impression that their plans have been delayed somewhat by the pandemic because last I heard this game was supposed to be announced in June and certainly it's by far the latest they've announced the Call of Duty game um, and I, I think they've obviously realised over the course of uh, the last six months with the tremendous success of Warzone which has got 75 million players that you know hey we have an opportunity here to you know announce our game to this massive 
captive audience that we yeah. have. So they're trying to, to do something uh, a bit different. I, I like what they're doing. I think the execution is not great um, because again, absolutely everyone knows that what the game is and that it's coming. And, you know, there's, they kind of started teasing it back in May, I think. Um, it's now August and they're so, only starting yeah. to properly carry that on again. Again, I think it's been delayed by the pandemic. I think what's happening now is supposed to be happening in, in June. Um, and from what I understand, from what I hear, this is, we're not even anywhere near the end either. This is going to go on for a couple of weeks. This um, this latest kind of teaser Easter egg hunt that they've got going on in Black Ops at the moment, and it's it's quite extensive as well. Like they were adding content to Black Ops Four, the game before last, where players would have to go back and find clues in that game, and it just led them to a website. Which by the time this video goes out, um, it will probably be be kind of live and kicking. But from what I understand, that it's just going to be another Easter egg hunt, and it's probably not even going to be the last one either. This is surely just all for the streamers, though, isn't it? I mean, most casual uh, Warzone yeah. players well, are they, not they really had, interested. One of one of these streamers had half a million people watching, so you know, they they they're getting the results that they want. Um, you know, and the the end result will always be the the which is probably more interesting, the new premium game, which uh, they've got no intention of of slowing down on. From what I heard, you know, it's going to be the. The free modes, usual campaign, multiplayer, zombies, um, and Warzone will be treated as this separate thing that kind of uh, feeds into all of the, the premium games, a bit like Call of Duty Mobile does at the moment. It's got kind of um, content from lots of different sub-brands from Call yeah. of Duty. They've never merged before. They've never had a crossover, mainly because Treyarch and, um, and Infinity Ward, the two main developers, are kind of staunchly um uh uh autonomous and uh yeah they they wouldn't have that in the past but i think activision activision is now seeing the huge success of uh, warzone and basically said you know get on with it because from what i was hearing at the start of the year before warzone came out it wasn't even a certain that black ops was you know, not going to have its own separate battle royale, you know, like a third one. Chris, is it probably fair to say that we're, we're seeing the natural evolution of um, Warzone now, basically? Not Warzone, so Call of Duty. Because uh, obviously, it's always been this year on year release kind of thing with the campaigns and the multiplayer. Um, is we're going to see some kind of like GTA Online kind of thing here where Warzone becomes this massive, huge beast that uh, Activision start to really put all their efforts into? Because, I mean, the, the, the numbers speak for themselves, really, don't they? Yeah, my laptop sounds like it's taking off. I apologize. Um, no, the, um, the, um, uh, yeah, I think so. I think Activision's always had a bit of a problem with Call of Duty in that um, uh, they keep trying to find different brands and different directions to take it in. And, you know, they've done it, you know, there's been Modern Warfare, there's been Black Ops, they've worked, and everything else pretty much hasn't. Um, and that they, um, and they're probably in a situation now where they've got those two brands and those are the two focuses. Um, and now they perhaps, can, they can now perhaps have a few breaks in the Call of Duty annual cycle if they need to because they've got this bm off of a product that they need to support and it will um generate significant revenue for them um i think that changes um the game for them in the same way that grand theft auto online has changed it for rockstar yeah um, rockstar has been able to release one whole fully original game this entire generation simply because their game they released the previous generation is making so much money and that is that's a that's a good position to be in, um, and it's and it's a more stable position to be in. You're not too worried if you have a bad Call of Duty year, then it means your financials are bad, and you know what Activision will do; they'll lay off half the company. So um, um, it's nice to be in that have that stability for any business. Um, but it is it's it's weird in that I've been writing about Call of Duty so much in my career, I've stopped caring. <laughs> you know, they're doing the most interesting things that they've ever done. I'm just a bit like, yeah, big, big, massive BM off company has made about where our loads of people playing it. Shocker. Um, but um, I, think, yeah. I think Call of Duty gets a bad rep. Um, you know, I love Ops, you actually. I love Ops, you. Last year's Black Ops was the first Call of Duty game I've played in best part of 10 years. Um, you know, I used to review them for CBG, you know, back in the Black Ops 1 days. And uh, Black Ops 4 was the first one I've got since, um, purely on the Battle Royale. Um, because I'd been playing PUBG, and as we kind of is now evident, uh, PUBG was obviously incredibly good fun. 
but it was also an incredibly uh, janky indie game. I mean, it's a lot better now. We're talking about two for two years ago. Um, you know, it still runs. It well at the time it ran like hell on PS4, and you go and uh, play that concept with the Call of Duty mechanics on it, and you really do realise how well made that game is. And it doesn't. It still doesn't get the credit it deserves. There is there are very few games out there that feel as good to play. As Call of Duty, uh, the things that you, things that you take for granted, you can go and play other battle royale games now, and it's incredibly apparent. Like in Call of Duty, you can sprint, you know, dive through a window, um, you know, uh, slide on the floor, shoot someone, switch to another gun, and it's all completely seamless. And you just can't do that in other games. It's not just because of the um, the people associated. Essentially, Call of Duty is a little boys' game. You know, a bunch of people are going to swear on chat and all that kind of stuff. Is it not a case of where the game doesn't get the, maybe the appreciation critically? I mean, it does get good reviews, to be fair. But still, is it not just because of the audience that it? I guess it's marketed to. Oh, and that's, it's, that's, you know, that's why it does. I guess that's why I'm assuming it doesn't get the credibility. Yeah, because it's the it's not trendy for. Are they cold play basically? To... <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Like, is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they're Fast and Furious, the films. Fast and Furious. Yeah. I was well, going to say that, yeah, they are the Fast and Furious big. of games. And, but actually, none of those films are good, so... No. Well, oh. they're, they're, they're perfectly good films. They're really well made. They're quite, you know, I'm not into them, but, you know, it's... The thing is, it's not that I don't think Call of Duty is good. I think it's excellent. I used to, I used to be such a fan. Such a fan. So I think I probably Modern still Warfare 2. Oh, I've, not, I've, not, I've not fallen out of love with the series. I just stopped playing it because, you know, I had other things to play. Um, yeah. But it's um, it's just um, you know, uh, it's just not very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair enough. But I mean, and I guess I, it, you know, it's been. It's, I think what you're trying to say, right, is that it's been so incredibly successful for more than a decade now that Call of Duty doing well is probably the most dull thing that you could cover, yeah. right? Next, yeah. you're gonna tell me lots of people bought FIFA. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not really, it's not, um, I mean, the next story we're going to talk about, I mean, we're going to, I'll, I'll try this, I'll sum up in one simple question. Who is going to win? Epic or Apple? Feel free to jump in. in <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, don't be so wrong. I billionaire uh, fights billionaire over <laughs> wanting to be more rich. Who um, cares? I mean, sorry, I know there is real world consequences. I know it will affect the industry massively, but as a layman looking back, I was like, Wow, is this the culture war we're having right now? I mean, personally, it feels I, like I it. quite, I quite respect Epic. I mean, this is—it's very cynical how they've gone about it. They clearly yeah, had this all planned. I wouldn't be surprised if it was sat in a drawer somewhere, waiting for this exact moment when Apple is facing four different probes from the EU. Microsoft and Facebook have both publicly criticised them in the last week for blocking their their streaming apps. Um, it's a very opportune moment to do this. However, as Chris just hinted. I quite like the fact that they're using their huge success to, um, you know, help try and change some of these issues among uh, the development scene. Yeah. Which is, you know, a lot of indie developers will be able to make more games if they didn't have to pay Apple tropes and cut, right? Just that's just the, uh, the truth. If people don't know, by the way, Epic literally uh, debuted a parody of Apple's 1984 commercial in Fortnite on Thursday, which is, that is ballsy, basically. The, as as um, Andy pointed out, they clearly had this ready. They knew what they were doing. This is, they, they essentially had, had, had a marketing campaign around this more or less, haven't they? Because they know what they're doing. And um, um, you're probably right to say that the industry probably is actually behind um, Epic on this front, because I guess it's... I, it's, think it's a, I think it's a bit crass how they've kind of tried yes. to weaponize their community of 12-year-olds um, <laughs> for their... You know, corporate. We want to make more money from Fortnite. Um, so. I mean, in, in, the, in the, they, they do, they do, but in their immediate defence, obviously, they're not asking for any compensation in this lawsuit. It's 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 clearly a uh, it's a monopoly thing. They're not asking for any kind of any uh, any of that thirty percent cut back. They're just saying that it's it's massively unfair. And ultimately, competition is good for everyone, right? Like, if more people could put stores on iOS. Then it would it would be better for everyone. I guess I'm always a little bit like Tim Sweeney changes his his attack. Originally it was Steam. Now he's moved on to Apple. I do wonder how long he starts before he starts directing it at consoles. Um, and um, uh, and then you know Nintendo are facing lawsuits about monopolies. Isn't there um, a suggestion that they might be getting a bit of a sweetheart deal on consoles? Well, epic. 
Yeah, I, I saw that suggestion recently. I mean, it's complete speculation, probably. But it's, it's the, the silence is deafening, isn't it? That the, the fact is exactly what you've just pointed out, that they're not kind of putting the target on the console manufacturers. Yeah, I mean, Sweeney did say, and I, I can't remember, I remember reading the interview a couple of years ago that he thinks it's a little bit different because consoles have an ecosystem um, that need to be cultivated and, cult and looked after by the, the, you know, by Nintendo, Xbox, PlayStation, everything from the technology, the systems, how you connect together. They've built that up. They've marketed that device. You know, it's, it's a little different. Um, and, um, and so the idea that you pay a, a tax effectively to access that group of people is, you know, is, is a little bit different than it being on a, on a phone or, or, or a PC, particularly on PC, I understand, but a phone, well, I, I think, is a little bit more in, the, in between. Would Apple what turn around and say that they mul they've cultivated a, a loyal iPhone following to, uh, as their counter to that, essentially, and it's a system that people use as well? I know it's not a, traditionally a gaming system, but I mean, surely the idea that, you know, Nintendo or Sony have cultivated this ecosystem themselves, I mean, Apple fanboys are real. They are a thing, you know. They, those people buy a new iPhone every single year. Isn't that a counter-argument to that point? I mean, I guess they, they, they'll do whatever they can justify it, right? I mean, games yeah. consoles have been slowly turning into PCs for, you know, more than 15 years now. Um, PCs, it's been accepted from the start, is an open system, right? And yet Xbox still, as we're, we're speaking, are charging people to play online. PlayStation is still charging people to play online. Imagine if someone suggested that in the PC space, like you'd be laughed out of the room, you know, they'll get away with what they can. And um, I guess the the big hypocrisy that's pointed out on the, the iOS platform is that they don't charge this cut for like, you know, Netflix and stuff like that. It's it's predominantly games which are being highlighted as, as being, you know, unfairly treated uh with 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 this cut and i i do kind of i do kind of see their point to be honest and i do think it would be better for consumers and it certainly would be better for developers if they lowered it yeah i mean there, well, is, there, is, there is there is other ramifications though that you know you never know how a developer company will react to this if apple starts making less money from other people's games which is what they do they're basically making money from other people's games on their platform do they start prioritizing their own games or their partners games do they start um um, promoting because you know if they're not going to make very much money of promoting the new Angry Birds game, <laughs> showing my age in the um, in the, on, the, on the front page of the App Store, do they start going? Well, we're going to promote our stuff because we will, you know, generate more revenue as a result. Of and that. in Apple, in Apple's defence as well, it is nice that you do kind of know that if you get something off the App Store, it's not going to be. There's no risk of it being shady or malicious, you know, which is less the case on Android. Whereas, which is a much more open platform. Yeah. Um, guys, thank you for joining us for another episode of VGC's Off the Record. We've chewed the fat on absolutely loads of things. Of course, we will be back next as well, next week as well. Sorry, let us know down in the comments what you make of all these stories. Obviously, the big epic versus Apple. Uh, epic. Oh, I'm tongue tied. I'm tired. We talked too much during this video. <laughs> <laughs> epic versus Apple battle. And also, let us know what you made about the Halo Infinite today and everything else going on down in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a like, subscribe. Thank you very much to Chris as well joining us once again. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, you got the lighting better. It looks really good now. You've, you've kind of mastered it towards the end of the I'm video. I'm using one floodlight now. Yeah, just the one. I'm using two, but I've just basically closed this one up a little bit. It's going to be like, a, it looks as nice, soon as Chris, when Chris leaves the room, there's going to be a game of five aside there. <laughs> Bielsa's training there. Chris is a Leeds fan, by the way. Up the Leeds. Um, and Andy, unfortunately, is a West Ham fan. <laughs> Uh, we're supposed to be friends we're supposed to be friends no I mean I, I, I'm, I'm a, apparently a glory hunter Manchester City fan so it doesn't really count anyway uh, guys thank you very much for joining us we'll see you next week on Off the Record make sure to hit the subscribe button see you later in a bit